Hit it! Hit it! Hit it! Um, before that time, the, the physics behind the physics. Another question. The actual 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 question. The actual
uh, the test scores of the school is, is very low. Um, it's uh, the, the percent of kids that are on free and reduced lunch uh, is around 90% and it's a 98% uh, black school. Uh, that's where I graduated from high school. I enjoy the Struma very much. Um, but one of the things that stand out to me, one of the things I remember at the school is uh, the school didn't have physics or calculus uh, the majority of the time that I was there. But I was lucky enough uh, to have the opportunity to take physics and calculus during my senior year because of a very ambitious teacher, uh, a teacher who uh, prided himself on uh, getting students from that school to compete successfully in, in math and science. Uh, so he was able to get that, get, get that into the school and at the same time uh, I attended a, a program where they said that LSU, Louisiana State University, uh, the flagship university of my home state, Louisiana, uh, required physics in order for admissions. Uh, so I decided to go ahead and take physics uh, so that I would uh, at least have the chance to apply uh, to my state's flagship university. Uh, so I took physics, I passed it. Uh, I actually did apply to LSU and got in uh, through a summer bridge program uh, and ended up graduating four years later. Uh, but midway through LSU, I went back to visit Struma and they had already eliminated physics from the curriculum again. And I'm looking around and I'm thinking to myself, this is a public high school and it's, it, their, their curriculum is inconsistent with a public university. So when I think of a moral imperative, uh, I see that as uh, virtually an amoral act to actually assign students to, to a school because they, you know, they didn't have uh, any choice in the schools that they attend if you live in that zip code unless you went to a private school. Um, but, in order, but, but to actually uh, have these kids go to that school and set them up to be eliminated uh, from certain schools. Uh, and this is something I wrote about in my report, Challenge the Status Quo. Uh, and this is just one example of things that are pretty widespread. And today, uh, that's, that happens all over the nation. Uh, if you look at the, the, the schools that educate the largest percentage of black and brown kids, uh, less than half of them require, uh, 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 have uh, physics and calculus in their curriculum. Learning about other people. And Reverend Dr. Philip Cato is a retired United work. States Navy chaplain with the rank of captain. For a number of years, he has conducted workshops on moral reasoning and professional ethics for the United States Naval Chaplain Corps, of the United Methodist Church, we learn how and our the fellow Episcopal human Church. beings have lived, what they have learned, the mistakes and the successes they have had, in short, the lessons of history. And eventually, we begin to learn what is beneficial and what is harmful as we go from day to day and year to year and place to place. Our continuing education at a base level remains as it was in the tribe with the primitive language, a survival skill. And that's one of the reasons it's so important for us to talk about access to education. It is a survival skill. In the evolution of life forms, and we are among those forms, all must be able to obtain food, avoid predators, and reproduce on the most elemental level. But for humans, our very developed neurological systems allow us to do more, to become rational, to think, and to be self-reflective. We find that we can step outside ourselves and turn around and observe ourselves. And when we, find, when we are faced with choices about unknown things, we human beings can mentally try out solutions before we act. We do not have to jump off a cliff to find out what happens when you do. We can learn what is useful and what is harmful, whether in foods or in day-to-day -day living or in political and religious interactions. We do this by observing, reading, discussions, travel, and formal learning by testing out what we have learned so far. So, learning, becoming educated, acquiring the learnings of the human community is enormously beneficial.
both to ourselves and to others. How to become a fully human person is something that must be learned. It does not come naturally. How to live among others in a way that is not harmful to yourself or to others is also learned. Our, our greatest gift in all of this is in having intellectual curiosity. And I would think that one of the things that we would want to instill in every child is an endless and insatiable hunger for knowledge, a burning desire to know how the world works. Each new piece of knowledge leads to more questions. And finally, perhaps our deepest wisdom is coming to know what we do not yet know. Since education and lifelong learning is our path to a good life and to a good society, and we all want to live, I think, in a good society, education is, as some say, not to put too fine a point on it, an absolute moral imperative. And I'll take us all back to grade school with the old Venn diagram. Charles Fitzgerald has studied economics, Western philosophy, and comparative world religions at Amherst College. He is currently studying for a master's in theology at Xavier University. He has been a mentor for adult education in Anne Arundel County at St. Martin's Episcopal Church for 13 years. He is co-founder of the adult education Carl program, IQ. Children of Abraham. There are those moments, however, when these two worlds tend to intersect. And it's in the moments when they intersect that insight and meaning and true connectedness take place. And these conversations that we lead in the class are structured specifically to create those moments. So as I'm listening to the panel, you know, the challenge that's coming to me is how do we, I'm dealing with adults, and my hope is that these adults, as their lives are enhanced by ever increasing the times in which we have this overlap, that it's being passed on to their children and their grandchildren. And the elephant starts being eaten one bite at a time. So the question that I'm is rolling in my head as the result of the conversation is, is there a way to transfer this program or a, a concept like this into the high schools of our area in the sense that, now of course, as soon as we put a religious tag on it, that creates its own set of issues, but there ought to be a way in which we could have a classroom where young adults are learning, as Dr. King says, to think intensively and to think critically. And that's really what I'm talking about. Now my, my universal structure is maybe the church, or it may be, a, may be a form of Christian perspective, okay? But there are many ways to create intellectual critical structures that would help young people take more personal responsibility for their lives in a way that where they begin to get a glimpse of what it means when we talk about the quality of life that comes from living an informed life. Because selfishly for them, it will, in my opinion, it will help them maybe rethink the choices they make as they proceed. But it's not for me, it's not their problem, it's our problem, and it's our challenge to find a way to share what we know with these people. As part of, uh, after 13 years of leading EFM, um, as I said, it was a four-year program for the adults who were in it, and by the end of the fourth year, everybody wants a year five. And we didn't have any year fives. So I had a 90-year-old colleague in 2011, ironically at the 10th anniversary of this day, who 
convinced me that Charlie, we're going to make a year five, and we're going to we're going to call it the Children of Abraham. So, without getting into the details of the Children of Abraham, it's essentially the same EFM format, where it's a combination of academics and personal exploration. But it's a look at the three faiths of Abraham, and we spend. At the present time, we're spent, it's a Christian group, unfortunately, and I say that unfortunately because my goal is for this to become something that we share, and I'll get to that in a second. But right now, for the last three years, we've had a different group every year, but it's all people who attend the church where I attend. And we spend, again, every other week, two and a half hours from September to May, exploring the roots of Islam, the roots of Judaism, and then looking at our own faith and discussing the way the three faiths address specific topics. For example, uh, the creation stories, the Noah story, the Abraham story, the, the relationship between God and man and God in the universe. Celebrating our similarities and honoring our differences and finding ways not to amalgamate and um, dilute the individual faiths, but as I said, to celebrate the differences and the mistake and what we have in common and find ways to live together. And where I would where we envision taking the program is instead of it being twelve people from St. Martin's and Severna Park sitting around the table, you have four Muslims, four Jews, four Christians, and you're doing this in a way that eats the elephant one bite at a time. The Khalil Shadid is the organizer of tonight's event. He is the president of Read One Communication and the producer of an award-winning television program, which this is a part of, called Scholars Chair, which features local scholars of philosophy, religion, and science. He is a co-founder of the but Islamic Society of Southern Prince George's County and member of the Interfaith Council of Suburban Maryland. The purpose of human existence is the realization of the, of the divine will. The realization and the fulfillment of the, the divine will. The fulfillment must take place voluntarily uh, and it is the responsibility of every individual to do so. Human beings are created by God according to Islamic scholars and some, some people have a, have, a, have a debate about this. The human beings are created rational and volitional. Uh, they are created as thinking human beings that have their freedom to choose what's right in the sight of God. God created humanity in the best forms for, uh, to the end of worshiping and serving the Creator. According to the Quran, God invested man with divine trust, those whose very nature requires that, it, it, that this fulfillment take, takes place in absolute freedom. What are the means of providing uh, for the accomplishment of this, of this divine purpose? Islam places great emphasis on the attainment of knowledge, productivity, and placing it as an act of worship. So we have both. The, the, the quest for knowledge, productivity, all as acts of worship. So we don't have the dichotomy in, that we have in many uh, other traditions where religion is done over in one corner and science and intellectual development is done in another corner. They are, they are one. This is part and parcel to of the Islamic notion of one God, one creator, uh, one creation. Uh, the idea that uh, that is that we're talking about is from an Islamic philosophy called El Tawhid. To be Muslim means to commit to uh, a lifetime of learning for the verification of faith in God. In the Arabic word, is called iman, iman, faith, God, faith, iman. Iman meaning, in this instance, is truth given to a critical and rational mind, not without evidence 
and not without the, the proper search for truth and facts. In other words, this is not a blind faith. This is not telling you to jump off the bridge and see if God saves you. It's saying, it's saying be, be conscious, be aware, be knowledgeable. The prophet has said, uh, has made many comments about, about knowledge. One of them is to acquire knowledge uh, is binding upon all Muslims, all people of faith, whether male or female. He says, travel uh, in search of knowledge. So uh, he says to him, he says that to do so uh, is, uh, in the sight of God, the way to paradise. The Quran supports this idea, and it says that are those equal to those who know and those who do not know, placing emphasis once again on the attainment of knowledge. It is those who endure with understanding that really remember uh, Allah's message. The Quran goes on to say that God Allah uh, will raise up suitable ranks and degrees to those who believe and who are granted knowledge. There are many instances where the Quran is going over and over again. One of the most famous verses, well, uh, I should say, one of the famous verses that, that uh, was the first revealed uh, verse in the Quran for, for Muslims, and that is, the word ikra. Ikra is the first word. Ikra meaning read, read, placing again emphasis on learning. I would I will abbreviate, abbreviate the the actual the total seven verses that, that go on here. Uh, but the, essentially, uh, knowledge is at the at the at the uh, is is the reason for the verse. It, and, and since I've introduced it that way, let me let me go ahead and read it the, the verse. It says, "Read the name of your Lord." and cherisher, who created, created man out of a mere clot of congealed blood. Proclaim, and thou Lord is most bountiful. He who taught the use of the pen taught mankind that which, he, which they knew not. Nay, mankind do transgress all bounds in that they look upon themselves as self-sufficient. Uh, it's almost as if 1400 years ago that you have this revelation almost directly uh, challenging our secular point of view. And, uh, and I found that very, very interesting. And, and there's a lot to say about that verse, but it is one of the first seven verses that appear, uh, that was revealed to the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Uh, I understand this to, be, to mean read in consciousness of your Lord, Cherisher, and Creator. It states that, that humanity is created for the process of, um, of achievement. Uh, progress is, is part of this, this whole idea of, um, of learning and acquiring, uh, acquiring knowledge. Uh, the Lord uh, that created man and gave the entire universe uh, to, to teach and educate the human mind. So we, we have uh, in the Islamic tradition, uh, a number of things, one of which is the requirement for law, the requirement for uh, stated contracts, a requirement for, uh, uh, for, going, uh, for going all over the world to acquire information and knowledge. It also allows, uh, creates the, uh, the foundation for, uh, for li liberty, uh, uh, the requirement for uh, justice, the requirement for peace, the requirement for, uh, uh, for constitutional law. Uh, there are a lot of things that are the, the effect of learned, learned individuals, or educated individuals. So I will, I will say with, with a brief conclusion that, that education is a moral duty for all people. We have the responsibility to, get, to educate all our children, not just the children who are advanced and who have resources, but all of our children. And this should be a principle that's not only something we do here in the States. We actually should do it uh, and think about it as a global issue. Uh, we should not stand idly by and watch some places where, for example, women are not educated. Uh, we, should, we should stand up. If we're going to take up arms, this is one of the things that we should, we should invest in. Um, there is a gentleman by the name of Dr. J uh, Johnston, Dr. Douglas Johnston. He's part of the Center for Democracy in Washington, D.C. 
his organization has invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in American scholars and educators and policymakers going over to Pakistan, Pakistan, the home, <laughs> the home of Al-Qaeda, uh, and helping them to reorganize the madrasas. So, you know, in, in, at their request, they wanted to do more than just teach uh, religious education. They also wanted to teach science and, and, um, and technology. So this organization went there to help them do that, which I think is, is you're going to invest in something that would be a better investment than, than war material. Education is uh, not only a moral issue, it is also very practical. Education is not only moral, but is also a survival value that uh, Dr. Cato has, has spoken to already, and, and uh, my good friend Charlie. And I must say that uh, Dr. Avery has put the, the, the point on the table that there is a serious problem of inequity in our society. So we, we, we have to address those issues. And, 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 and more than anything else, and lastly, um, to, to obtain knowledge is, is definitely uh, a, a moral imperative, uh, but it is also quite clearly and quite frankly um, a responsibility that we owe to God and ourselves. To me, that a, this is a very large question, as you obviously recognize, that this is a question, for me, posed to the human community, however it manifests itself. And it's going to manifest itself on a whole series of different levels. It happens in the family. It happens on the level of the local community, which is where we sponsor schools, and it happens on the national level in terms of the commitment of a country. It's interesting to me that when we try to talk about whether we're going to do this, that, or the other internationally in this country, we always ask the question, is this in the national interest to do so? And I would say having educational as a moral imperative is very much in the national interest for the simple reason that in order for a society to develop uh, and to escape the harms that can come when it is not developed properly, people have to be educated. And so it, 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 you can be selfish about it or you can be religiously faithful about it. There are a whole variety of possible motivations, but the end result is the same. If we are not educated, if we're not trying to bring all those who are not educated among us along the path of education, then we're going to suffer the consequences. I really think it starts with the individual. I think that, and I'm going to go back to the word I use, selfish. Um, education has selfishly helped me. It has allowed me to become the person I've become. And I think it's my job, and I believe the job of every person in this room, to share that knowledge that each of us has because of the educations we have and to help young people understand that they need to take responsibility for their own lives. And it's not going to be easy because the playing field didn't start level. But they've got to understand that if they can commit themselves to education, what that will mean to them for their futures. And I think the only way that happens is for us as individuals to begin to attack this one bite at a time. If I sit back and wait for the schools to do it, for the teachers to raise my children, for the community to raise my children, please don't misunderstand me. The life of community is critical to the lives of children. It's critical, but it, for me, it doesn't start there. It's gotta start with individual one-on-one -on -one relationships that we intentionally decide it's worth our time because we have hours every day. We have to make the choice of how each of us in this room spends our time. And I'm talking to myself. And when, I'm, when I look at what education has done for me, selfishly, uh, there's no greater motive than that. It's not a dirty word. It's a good thing. Because when, when we are motivated and when those kids are motivated, they will do great things. It's not just a financial charity. It's not a food, just giving food, access, food, extra food you have or extra money. It's whatever you have. And if you have knowledge, then it's incumbent upon you to give of that. And, and, and if, you, if you don't find the environment for it, go and find where there are needy people for that particular skill or whatever you have. And uh, put that in their, uh, in their hands and, and let them utilize it. It's an incumbent on us. And I